This video is brought to you by Omaze. On January 24th, 1984, hundreds of people attending an Apple shareholders conference saw the personal computer speak. After an hour of boring numbers and graphs, a clean-cut, confident Steve Jobs had the floor, where he had taken this new device out of a canvas bag, a three and a half inch floppy disk out of his front pocket, and boldly announced, today, for the first time ever, I'd like to let Macintosh speak for itself. This is what it said. Hello, I am Macintosh. It sure is great to get out of that bag. Unaccustomed as I am to public speaking, I'd like to share with you a maxim I thought of the first time I met an IBM mainframe. Never trust a computer, you can't lift. Obviously I can talk, but right now, I'd like to sit back and listen. So, it is with considerable pride that I introduce a man who's been like a father to me, Steve Jobs. The people who already familiarized themselves with the Apple II saw the smoke and mirrors. But for the rest, it was almost as if Apple had created something sentient. They created life. A concept that only seemed possible in the Jetsons ten years prior, now conceived. Just a couple of hours before, no one had even known what this device was. Only something that mystified millions of people when it was first uttered at the 1984 Super Bowl through an even more mysterious commercial. It was just Macintosh. This was a turning point for Apple as a company. They had a new focus of challenging the corporate computer conglomerate IBM. It was taking over the world. Apple was different. The Macintosh was going to be a computer by the people, for the people, and that's what this commercial represented. A computer anybody could use with literally just the click of a button, rather than through some convoluted command lines that seemingly only the most niche of nerds can understand. A computer even children could use. When The Breakfast Club was having Saturday detention in Shermer, Illinois, Sean Ono Lennon was celebrating his ninth birthday with Steve Jobs and Andy Warhol, playing on Mac Paint. At a superficial glance, the Macintosh, in retrospect, looks over 10 years ahead of its time. It's honestly insane that a machine as sophisticated as this could have even existed in the early 1980s. But as the Apple II users saw at the time, this was the smoke and mirrors talking. Despite all this, the Macintosh just didn't have the future Steve Jobs thought it would. Instead, it sort of just dwindled away, but not how you would expect. Macintosh, with its decline, created a series of butterfly effects, both detrimental and extremely culturally significant in the long term. It took so much away, but also gave us everything. How? This is a machine with a story filled with as many complexities as its own moving parts. A story which blurs the line between computer folklore and fact. This is the story of Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 was not like 1984. Getting a Macintosh would have been a pretty nice gift back in 1984, but what's even nicer is a Tesla Model X, and you have a chance to win it, thanks to Omaze. Omaze does giveaways of incredible prizes and experiences while donating money to chosen charities all around the world. The Model X is Tesla's most sought after, top of the line flagship SUV, and boy does it show. It is unmatched in versatility and power with its all new interior and exterior design and 1,020 horsepower. Out camping? Sit back under the stars and watch your favorite movie on a 17-inch cinematic display and glass panoramic roof. I can just picture myself watching Austin Powers right now. Peak humanity. 
Donations help support nonprofits and charities, allowing them to spend less time on raising money and more time on serving the needs of their communities. These charities are Give Power and 501c3. Give Power is committed to helping the 2.2 billion people around the world who don't have access to clean drinking water, using deep solar expertise to provide clean water, food security, and light to communities all around the world. 501c3 is dedicated to finding solutions that will help us fight climate change and build a cleaner and more sustainable sustainable future for a younger generation. For your chance to win a Model X and support a great cause, go to omaze.com slash nationsquid. The early phases of Max development started at a time where technological ambition was through the roof. The 80s didn't just see a new wave in music, but also in computing. And it all started in 1977 with a little machine called the Apple II. Although not technically the first of its kind, it was unique and revolutionary enough to be widely considered the very first personal computer to become popular. Not only was the Apple II now at the top of the computing world, it was Apple's entry to the big leagues, and it sparked a movement for personal computers as a legitimate, profitable market. Several big companies now wanted in to create the next big personal computer. And not too long after, someone did. In 1981, a company that had only been growing bigger since the end of World War II enters the picture. A company so big that it was well on its way to becoming a monopoly in the machine industry, derogatorily nicknamed Big Blue based on its blue logo. Here enters the IBM PC, a machine very easy to use in comparison to everything else that was available. It would become the first PC to dominate the Apple II's sales, and it only took them a few months. Apple might have been riding the wave of the Apple II for quite some time, but technology was changing quickly, and this was a wake-up call. The Apple II was already four years old, and small upgrades wasn't going to be enough. The company was no longer number one, and they had to act fast before they fell even further. Apple had to innovate once again. The IBM's launch marked a second wave in personal computing. Steve Jobs was determined to create the third industry standard machine. Priority was now placed on a project Apple had been working on for a few years, the Apple Lisa. This was going to be the computer that changed everything because it surrounded a brilliant concept. What if you could get everything done with just the click of a button? Of course, we are talking about the mouse and the desktop environment, also known as the GUI. Knowing all these sophisticated commands was no longer necessary to operate a computer. You could just click what you want and type what you want. Jobs had gotten the idea in 1979 after visiting Xerox Research Center in Palo Alto, California, where he had come across the Xerox Alto, a computer from 1973 with a keyboard and mouse. But considering that the Alto was $32,000 not adjusted for inflation and never sold commercially, obviously hardly anyone had even heard of it. The idea was still up in the air in terms of its practicality. Jobs wanted to change that with the Lisa. Now everyday businesses could get tons of work done without having to spend months on learning code and reading manuals. The concept was brilliant, but during its production, it wouldn't take long for business politics to enter the picture. Jobs was very difficult to work with when creating the Lisa, so much so that he was kicked from the project. Disagreement over how the computer should be designed and how it should be priced led to a very Game of Thrones maneuver. Steve Jobs would lead his own project and recruit his own employees to help him create the computer he wanted to make, essentially competing with the Lisa on who could make the better machine. Jobs resurrected a dormant Apple project called the Macintosh, a project created in 1979 by Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak and employee Jeff Raskin. The name came from Raskin's favorite fruit, a Macintosh apple, and he and Wozniak had the vision of making a computer that was cheap, simple, and aimed at the everyday person. This would be the perfect competitor for the Lisa. The big selling point for the Lisa was its easy to use desktop environment. But what if you could make it even easier? So easy that anyone could use it, including your 85 year old grandmother, a computer that would come with its own games, word processor, graphics editor, other programs provided by Microsoft, and it could even talk to you. Steve Jobs took the boldest marketing risk you could possibly make and made his target audience everyone, trying to solve everyone's problems while also solving problems people didn't even know existed yet. The Macintosh was born, and Jobs made it very clear that this would be the third industry standard for computing. Today, one year after Lisa, 
We are introducing the third industry milestone product, Macintosh. Completely disregarding the new Commodore 64, which had just become the highest selling computer of all time. With its GUI and mouse, the Macintosh would triumph everything else. Jobs was so confident in Mac's future, he convinced Pepsi president John Scully to join his team because of how much he admired Scully's marketing capabilities, where Jobs reportedly said to him, do you want to sell sugared water for the rest of your life? Or do you want to come with me and change the world? The Lisa proved to be a giant failure at its launch. With its slow speeds, poor design, and a market price of $10,000, no one wanted to buy it. This only gave Jobs a bigger advantage, because the Macintosh would do everything the Lisa could, but much cheaper and more efficient. Jobs' decision to bring on Scully proved to be successful. People were excited about this new machine. Jobs was so determined on taking down IBM's monopoly that nothing else mattered, including how practical the Macintosh was. And this would be deeply reflected in the product itself. The Max launch did anything but exceed expectations. The media was projecting sales that had never been seen before in the history of computers. And at the start, that is what they got. But when the machine finally had enough time to truly reveal itself, the rose-tinted glasses came off, and things took a sharp turn. With how development went, it's easy to see, in hindsight, that the Macintosh was actually none other than a deeply flawed machine. The headstrong leadership from Steve Jobs created a product with an overconfident design, slightly misleading marketing campaign, high cost, and lack of a real-world practical use. There is a bit of an arrogant energy to the Macintosh, and that is intentional. I mean, its whole existence surrounded taking over a multinational corporation and becoming a household product. The Macintosh knew it was the coolest thing in the room, but did it actually have the goods to back that up? Although Apple thought at the time that this was a selling point, all it did was heighten user expectations only to disappoint them. The Macintosh, in many respects, is literally a personification of Steve Jobs himself. He really did see this as not so much an invention, but a work of art. The inside casing even contained the signature of everyone involved in its development, like a signature on a painting. It was an overconfident machine, which was a direct result of Jobs' overconfidence during development. The problems that caused the Lisa's downfall strongly paralleled the issues present on the Macintosh. Jobs focusing more on form than function, wanting to create a beautiful machine in a time where that technologically wasn't very realistic. When Apple engineers told him that his ideas would compromise the performance of the machine, he wouldn't listen, and it was this kind of thinking that got him kicked off the Lisa team. But he only continued doing this with the Macintosh. He wanted the computer to be silent, so it did not include a fan, which was an open invitation to overheating from the simplest task. Because of this, and the appearance of its floppy drive, the computer was nicknamed the Beige Toaster. This design choice created a machine that was severely underpowered and slow, even for 1984 standards. Not only was its cooling bad, but so were its parts, at least for what it was designed to do. Back in 1984, people were excited about the idea of mainstream 32-bit computers. Most computers like the IBM or the Commodore were either 16 or 8-bit systems. These companies all wanted to create 32-bit personal computers, but it was very expensive. The Macintosh was a 32-bit computer, and this was actually quite a huge breakthrough at the time, but it wasn't the full story. The Macintosh had a 32-bit processor, but a 16-bit data path, which meant some parts of the CPU could only operate 16 bits of data at once. So while the Macintosh could technically call itself a 32-bit system, it was more like a 16-bit one. Not to mention that the machine's 128 kilobytes of memory was more suited for 8-bit systems. All this technical stuff can get a bit confusing, but what you really need to know is that these were parts that weren't very compatible. It was the computer equivalent of mixing oil and water, and what you got was a slow, confusingly designed machine with an identity crisis. And the worst part was, if you wanted to upgrade the RAM, you couldn't. Everything was soldered to the motherboard. 
This was a huge deal. As far back as the 1970s, computers were all about upgradability. At that time, most people just went to the hardware store, bought the parts they needed, and built their own PCs. Every PC was unique, and it remained that way until the Apple II came along and commercialized pre-built machines. These values still graduated through the 80s. People who bought pre-built often put in their own parts over time. So what was even the point of the Macintosh if you couldn't upgrade it? Where is the personal, impersonal computer? All Jobs did was take the Lisa's problems and the problems he had with the Lisa team and then simplify them. Nearly all the creative decisions that went into the Macintosh were things that the Lisa team specifically told Jobs not to do. It took big steps backwards because it was trying so hard to be the computer of the future. Steve Jobs' unmoved thinking with building the Macintosh permeated through its marketing. Being overconfident in its design, the Macintosh was also overconfident in its capability. The marketing of the Macintosh wasn't exactly the most honest, and people who owned Apple IIs and were following the Lisa project could see right through this. The Macintosh campaign had a big emphasis on software. A lot of people thought this was because Apple wanted to hide the fact that they didn't want to build an upgradable machine. Broken parts meant only Apple could fix it, meaning more money for Apple. Apple's excuse was that, for the personal computer, customization really is mostly software now. Apple was now focusing more on building computers like the Lisa and less on ones like the Apple II, which felt like a step back. I mean, they all saw how the Lisa went, so they weren't exactly in high faiths about having the Macintosh just be history repeating itself. Apple computers were no longer going to be upgradable like they used to be. And to divert people from that kind of thinking, Apple essentially over-delivered on the Mac software. The commercials really seem to show a big range of different programs working at high speeds to really emphasize how easy it is to use. But the computer only shipped with two programs, MacWrite and MacPaint. Everything else had to be bought separately, and you only had a handful of options compared to other computers at that time. And as we talked about, the computer's memory wasn't really designed for these programs, so a lot of people complained about slow performance. The Max demo at Apple's shareholders meeting is a perfect example of this deception. The computer you are seeing here isn't actually the original Macintosh at all. It's the 512K Macintosh, which wouldn't launch until nine months later. Even Jobs knew that the software wouldn't run ideally on the actual device and had to improvise. But that wasn't the only misleading factor. So was the part that blew everyone away. Hello, I'm Macintosh. The speaking portion was made possible through a program called MacSpeak, also known more commonly as Macintosh. As breathtaking as it was, text-to-speech software wasn't exactly unheard of in 1984. I mean, the Speak and Spell was created by Texas Instruments just a couple years prior, which you could buy for $50 at any corner toy store. Macintosh was derived from an already existing synthesizer called SAM. But what if you wanted it to say full-on sentences, paragraphs? That's why it was so cool to see on a personal computer. It gave the Macintosh a personality. The original plan was to include Macintosh in the system folder and have it shipped in all Macs on the day of its launch. Unfortunately, this never happened. A big reason for why Steve Jobs used the prototype 512K Mac for the demo was because the actual Macintosh couldn't handle the program. The memory was too low. Macintosh wouldn't be a big part of the operating system until the 512K machines became more commonplace in 1985. So the big selling point for Apple in this demo was something Apple wasn't even selling. When reality set in, less people were buying the Macintosh. Apple suffered a little case of marketing myopia. While Apple recognized the wants and needs of the average person, they failed to recognize the average person's salary. The Macintosh was priced far better than the Lisa, but was still very expensive for a personal computer. Jobs wanted to make the computer as cheap as possible, but was that a bit of a war with Scully? Because the Super Bowl commercial was so expensive, Scully raised the price to $24.95 from Jobs' price of $19.95. 
Jobs would cite this as a huge reason for why the Macintosh didn't sell well. No one wanted to buy a personal computer that expensive, especially when its true capabilities were eventually revealed. Apple computers are very low powered and very highly priced. Yeah. And that's true of all Apple products. When combining all three of these problems, you are left with a product that lacked any practical use back in 1984. Software was very limited, and the things that were available weren't particularly useful at the time. A graphics editor was cool for five minutes, and less cool when it's only in black and white. The Commodore 64, IBM PC, Tandy 1000, and even the Apple II all had word processors, more software support, were upgradable, and were even in color. Why get a Macintosh when you could buy one of these other machines for more capability and customization at a much more affordable price? Now, the Macintosh didn't die, but its sales were nowhere near what was expected. It didn't just put itself in danger, but Apple. Their objective to tackle IBM failed. Higher-ups at Apple were quick to start pointing fingers. Jobs blamed it on the high price. Scully blamed it on Jobs. His unrealistic thinking and the way he treated his employees put him to blame. Scully wanted to create more products like the Apple II. Jobs wanted to give Macintosh another chance. Because of this entire ordeal, Jobs was voted out of the company by the board in 1985, or voluntarily left, depending on whose side you're on. Jobs was now out of the company he started. But this didn't discourage him. Although creating the third industry standard machine didn't go as planned, he was determined to get it right the fourth time and create the next industry standard machine. In fact, that was the name of his new company, Next, to represent this objective. And we decided we wanted to start a company that had a lot to do with education, and in particular, higher education, colleges and universities. Now, the full story of Next Computer and Jobs' time away from Apple will be its own separate video, so I will just provide a general summary for now. In 1985, Apple was very divided. You had Team Scully and you had Team Jobs. Next was the company created by Team Jobs to directly compete with Apple and everyone else. My, that's exactly my point. We've got a person here that said he can do a word processor in six months. It's taking three years. Well, George, I can't change the world, you know? What, what, what do you want me to do? What's the solution? I think Yeah, I mean, I don't want to hear, just because we blew it last time, we're going to blow it this time. No, no, but but you like see, we, what we can learn is why- I, What I want is probably irrelevant. Instead of personal computers, Next was creating highly advanced workstation computers, not aimed at people, but highly funded businesses and universities. This would eliminate the high cost problem that the Macintosh had. The computers would have an emphasis on 3D graphics and simulations, and run its own GUI operating system called NextStep. The Next computers didn't sell well, but the software did. Next Step was insanely influential because of the design of the GUI and its use of object-oriented programming. This is why it could run 3D simulations so well. Eventually, Next would discontinue their line of computers and exclusively sell their software. Because he was working with the technology so much, Jobs wanted to explore the 3D design world even further. He would go on to purchase a company from George Lucas called the Computer Graphics Lab. The company name would be changed to Pixar, and for the next decade would now focus on making films exclusively using 3D animation. During all of this, Apple was just barely surviving. Their innovation was gone, and they mostly relied on making remedial upgrades to the Macintosh line all throughout the 1990s. It wasn't clear that Apple would still be around by the millennium. The Oz Festival! Eesh. It was sponsored by that guy from Apple Computers? What computers? Uh. With big losses in the last quarter, with profit margins shrinking, Apple seems destined for a takeover. Scully had long since left the company, and it was clear that Jobs was doing much better without them. And in the most desperate of decisions, Apple bought Jobs back in 1997. They would acquire all the rights to the Next Step software and elect Jobs as the CEO. His first order of business? Revamp the Macintosh. In order to compete with all the other computers during the prevalence of a new technology called the Internet, Jobs replaced the decrepit original macOS with a new version founded on Next Step. 
the iMac was born, and Apple would only go uphill from there. Because of the original Macintosh sucking, we now have Toy Story and Mac OS X. Seriously, what was originally scoffed at, disparaged, and called nothing more than a toy by its contemporaries ended up becoming the most influential invention in human history. The Macintosh was both inept and misunderstood. It was both ahead of its time and behind it. But as its parts grow old, its attitude gets younger. The message was now clear. Computers could not be confusing anymore if they wanted to get more powerful. The only way to maximize their capabilities is by maximizing their audience, to appeal to all kinds of people who can share all kinds of perspectives, ideas, and new information, to be continuously innovative and forward-thinking, to be Macintosh, the computer for the rest of us. Be sure to visit omaze.com slash nations quid for a chance to win a Tesla Model X. Shut the hell down. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe and click the notification bell so that you don't miss a future video.